Hi, everybody. Um, wel <laughs> welcome to another um, exciting webinar with Boostlingo and Alta Language Services. They're going to be, um, Nicole and Stephanie are here with us. They're going to be talking about some of the changes that have, have gone um, undergone with this, this last year um, in their training program. So let me get this presentation format and we'll get started. All righty. Um, so, and Stephanie, Nicole, I don't, I can't see you guys. Hold on. Show all screens. Okay. Um, anyways, why don't you get started? Um, and I'll try to figure out the, the configuration here as we go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Caroline. So my name is Stephanie uh, Cork, Stephanie Wiley Cork. Um, I work with Alta Language Services. Um, to briefly introduce ourselves, uh, my background is in um, medical interpretation. I'm a Spanish interpreter. Um, so I have worked both as an agency interpreter and also as a staff interpreter at a level one trauma hospital um, and have worked with Alta for uh, many years at this point, uh, teaching our medical interpreter training. Uh, and my current position is that I'm the director of our training department here at Alta. Um, we gave a presentation with Boostlingo last year on um, our class, and we've made some really good updates to the class since then. So we're excited to share um, the way that the class looks now. Um, yeah, we're just excited to talk through some things with you guys and show you what we've made. Thank Hello, you. everyone. And, and Nicole's with us too. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nicole, and um, I just wanted to give you a little, a little information about my background. I have Nicole, if you can, Caroline, can you hear? Very similar background as this. Um, I did a level. Um, and I've also worked at several different agencies. I became nationally certified back in 2017. Can you guys hear? I, I don't know if I'm freezing out or if you're freezing out. Um, I think there's a little bit of a delay, um, but I, so maybe you could just reiterate what, what you just mentioned again. Just gonna pause for a second. Sure, yeah. While we, if I catch that. Did, Caroline, can you repeat that? I was just saying that I think there's a bit of a delay, um, a little Stephanie, bit of a delay. Can you hear me? I can see you. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, should I reintroduce myself? Were you guys able to hear me? We can just okay. do a quick. All right. Quick Hello intro. again, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my name is Nicole. Um, I my background is in medical interpreting. I'm just going to do a really quick introduction so we can get this um, presentation going. I work with Alta now um, as a healthcare liaison, and my job is to work with healthcare systems to implement all sorts of language services. We're going to talk to you a little bit about um, the path towards professionalism. When I was an interpreter, this is something that I really never knew um, what where to go after getting my training or become starting to have interest in working as an interpreter. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about how Alta can help you with this path towards professionalism. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm visiting my family right now um, in Puerto Rico. So there's a lot of chickens and roosters and a lot of um, background noise that you might hear. So don't mind my roosters if you hear anything. Um, <laughs> everything is okay over here. Just a little, you know, talk to do a little doing. <laughs> Kiki, -ki -ki. yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right, so we'll skip to the next slide. Um, today we're gonna go over um, a couple of different things leading up to talking about um, Alta's interpreter training specifically. So we'll give you a very brief background of Alta's um, services and our history. We're gonna talk about limited English proficiency specifically in the US, um, health disparities that are specifically related to language. Um, and we're also going to talk about the importance of using trained interpreters and the importance of interpreters being trained um, and the different things that can come up due to lack of training 
legislation that's related to training requirements, that sort of thing. We're also going to talk about um, what it means to be a qualified interpreter versus a certified interpreter, um, some tips for choosing an interpretation course, and we're also going to give you a tour of Alta's training so that you can see what it looks like. A lot of times people call us and they say, I don't really have a good understanding of how an online training works. What does it actually look like? So we will show you. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, the path towards national certification um, and how Alta fits into that. We can go to the next slide. Okay, awesome. Um, a little bit about Alta. So Alta Language Services, we're a full service language service provider. We've been in the language industry for over 30 years. We provide a full suite of language services. Interpretation training is a big part of it. We're gonna touch on that in a second, but we also do other things like translation, interpretation, language testing, and also just general language training if you wanna work on um, language skills in a particular language. One thing that's really unique about Alta is that we're 100% employee owned. That means that we're all really um, invested into putting out really good products for our, our clients and for you as interpreters. Um, and, you know, client care is really at the center of what we do. And a little bit of information on interpretation training department. Um, our department, interpretation training department is dedicated to the development and the delivery of fresh, relevant, and engaging curriculum for medical interpreters at all levels. So we are going to talk primarily about our, our BBIH program, there's a rooster, um, but we're also going to talk to you a little bit about other um, services that we offer for interpreters that have already received that, that baseline training and how you can further your education as a path to professionalism. You know what's going to happen a lot during the, this call because I've been quiet all morning. Um, and one, one more thing is that our highest priority is providing uh, quality training with superior client experience. So that's really good quality training for you guys. Next slide. Thanks, I think Karen. to note here too is that so we have uh, training for people who are just getting started, uh, training for people who have already gotten started but want to prep for national certification, and training for people who have national certification and need to keep it. So if you work in the medical interpreting profession, we have training that's relevant to you. Um, so we will talk through all of those different things here in a moment. Um, but before we get started, and this may be information you guys already know, but just to make sure that we're covering it and getting it out of the way before we start, um, it's important to clarify terms. Um, interpreter versus translator. Uh, translator is a uh, term that is often used interchangeably with interpreter uh, incorrectly. So my mom calls me a translator, mm -hmm. NPR calls us translators, um, but we train interpreters. So the difference is um, interpretation is the facilitation of a spoken conversation. Um, and translation would be the conversion of like a written document into another language. So if a doctor needs to talk to a patient, they would need to work with an interpreter. If a doctor needs a surgical consent form written in Italian, then that would be the work of an Italian translator. Um, so uh, we have to correct people who come into class all the time. We want to make sure that we're using the right terms. Um, to define ourselves and, you know, to, to make sure that our students are set up for success when they go into interviews and different things like that, knowing that they're uh, calling themselves by the correct name. So we are interpreter trainers. Um, we are also going to be using the word target language here pretty frequently. Um, this just means the language that you're interpreting into. Um, so if you think about your language pair, it's usually English, uh, at least for the people that we're talking to today, um, and then your other language or languages. Um, so if you speak Arabic, then your target language would be Arabic. Um, we're also going to use the acronym LEP quite a bit. This stands for Limited English Proficient or Limited English Proficiency. Um, and actually, Nicole will give us a bigger definition of that here now. Um, next slide, please. All right, so limited English proficiency, um, this refers to anybody that self-identifies as um, having English skills that are less than very well, that speak English less than very well. One really important thing that I think about that I find interesting about this definition is that they use the term somebody that self-identifies. Um, and I think that's really important because when I worked as an interpreter, I would constantly hear you know, people telling patients, oh, your English is really good. We can go over this consent form. And it's really important as interpreters um, for us um, to kind of give patients the space or just uh, for us to advocate for patients when necessary. Um, and 
ask people to give patients a, um, the space to determine for themselves, one, what their level of English proficiency is, and two, what language they would prefer to have their medical information in. So it should be the patient's determination if they're LEP or not, and if they need interpretation services or not. Um, and a couple of stats here about limited English proficiency here in the United States. One in five people in the US speak a language other than English at home. Um, so that's huge, you know, one in five, there's three of, three of us hosting this conversation. And I know that I speak a language other than English at home, so that refers to me. <laughs> um, uh, another stat for LEP is that 20 million people in the US speak English um, less than very well. So there's roughly about 20 million people um, that are LEP here in the United States. So these are people that um, would need access to their health information in a language other than English. And another thing to note, Nicole, I don't, I don't know if you mentioned this, but this is a Census Bureau definition. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, so we talked about 20 million people that are limited English proficient here in, here in the United States. There, um, there's also a really big medical interpreta uh, interpreter shortage in the United States. And we use this example of California. California has 1.7 million people that speak limited or no English in the state of California. And if you tally up these numbers, um, the numbers for the CMI, CHI, and um, the core CHIs, so these are certified medical interpreters in the state of California, there's um, close to 2,000 people to service a population of 1.7 million. So that just goes to show you what um, that this interpreter shortage actually looks like. Um, and this is especially true for languages of lesser diffusion. I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard this term, but languages of lesser diffusion um, refers to languages that are less dense, um, less densely spoken. So that doesn't mean that there's less speakers. There just means that they're less dense in a certain area. Um, and they use this example uh, of San Diego. There was a Juan Hobal speaker that had to wait um, for over a year for their asylum seeker, um, for their asylum hearing pardon because there are no interpreters available for Kwan Holbong. So this is what um, this medical, this interpreter shortage actually looks like. This means that people need to get their services um, pushed back and they don't have access to these vital services because there's no interpreters available. Or the alternative is that people say, well, we'll just make it work. And they, they try to figure something out, which can be dangerous. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, limited English proficiency and health disparities. So let's talk about this term health disparities for a second. Um, health is the, defin the definition for health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health. So some type of preventable difference that, um, that kind of excludes or affects a, a, a subset of the population um, in their ability to reach, uh, achieve optimal health. So when we talk about language um, or health disparities that are, that are caused by language or language that affects these health disparities, there's a couple of things that we can obviously just automatically think about. One of them that is pretty easy to kind of correlate is a poor understanding of diagnosis, discharge instructions, and medications. So obviously, if you're not getting your information or if you're getting your information in a language, other than, um, in a language that you don't understand, you're going to have a poor understanding of this. If somebody gave me my health information in Chinese and Mandarin or Cantonese, I would not understand it. So I would have a poor understanding of my diagnosis. Um, and then the same is true for an increased risk of medical errors. So think about that. Um, when patients don't have all the information that they need and can't fully participate in their health care, there's an increased use, um, increased risk of medical errors and medical and misdiagnosis. LEP patients are also more likely to experience drug complications. You know, um, I have an example that just quickly comes to mind. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of Spanish speakers in, in here, but I'm going to uh, interpret this for you so everyone's on the same page. Um, the, the word once a day, O-N-C-E, once, that in Spanish um, translates to 11. So once is the number 11. Um, so I heard of a case where a patient um, had discharge instructions and they were told to take their medication once a day, but they read the word 11. They were read once. 
and they ended up taking 11 instead of one. So they took 11 times um, their medication just because, you know, they read it. They probably thought that this was, you know, they obviously thought that's what they had to do. But that's an example of uh, a, a drug complication because of uh, a language barrier. Preventable. Also, preventable drug. Uh, exactly. Thank you, Stephanie. And, and exactly, a preventable um, drug complication. Also, LEP patients tend to have longer hospital stays. Um, there was a study that, that kind of went over, over this, that having, not having access to trained interpreters would, would actually keep the patient, patients in, in the hospital longer if they were limited English proficient. Um, another health disparity for, that's affected by language is a decreased access to care. You know, and this is something that I saw a lot working as an interpreter. I used to work in the ER that was um, in, in a small kind of regional hospital. And patients would tell me all the time, you know, I didn't come because I didn't know that there was interpreters here, or I didn't come because I, I didn't want to come here and not be able to communicate. Um, so patients would sometimes just come to the hospital when they were just at the point that they couldn't put it off any longer, when they, when, when they were really, really sick. Um, so this is really the importance of our work as interpreters, just us just having interpreters in a hospital make, make the community um, that's LEP feel more confident in going to the hospital. Um, higher rates of intubation. I'm gonna let Stephanie talk about this one because she has a really good story about it. Um, so Stephanie, go ahead, do your thing. Yeah, sure. So intubation is when a tube is introduced into, um, into a patient's airway. Um, and I spoke with a doctor about this one time and she said, I would never have believed um, that LEP patients experienced higher rates of intubation. But then she heard, I think it happened in front of her. I can't remember if she, her tell a bit. Basically, she said that there was a patient that came into the hospital. They called an interpreter. The interpreter came, said, I can't understand this patient. They called another interpreter. The next interpreter came. They said, I can't understand this patient. They intubated the patient. And then later, um, they realized that the patient was a Japanese speaker um, and that they were fully capable of, of coherent thought and communication. Um, so it is it is something that that we see higher rates of. Yeah, thank you for that, Stephanie. Um, one other example of a health disparity is up triaging. So up triaging is this term, it's actually a phenomenon that describes when a, a patient, when there's a language barrier between a provider and a patient, they're not able to communicate. One thing that the studies have found that providers tend to do is order a bunch of tests. So because they can't communicate during a patient interview, they can't get the information from the patient. You know, like the first thing that you do when you go to a doctor is you tell them, hey, I'm, this is bothering me, this is bothering me, this is bothering me, help me out. Um, because they can't have this conversation, what providers end up trying to do to investigate what's going on is just ordering a bunch of tests, you know, and these sometimes are invasive tests. Um, so they're putting, so patients are going through all these unnecessary tests just to get information that could be acquired just by having an interpreter there or having a way to bridge the language barrier. Right. So, okay, Caroline, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so uh, with all of this in mind, knowing that these health disparities exist, one of the things that we wanna talk about is the federal legislation that exists around language access requirements for any organization, hospital, healthcare clinic that is federally funded. So if any hospital sees a patient who has Medicaid or Medicare, for example, then they are receiving federal funding in some way and are therefore beholden to this legislation. Um, Section 1557 is a piece of legislation that is under the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Um, I think this was enacted in 2016. Right, Nicole? Yeah, yep. Okay, 2006, it's recent-ish, right? So um, basically what this legislation does is it gives us clear parameters for um, the requirements that we have for people who are providing uh, professional interpretation services and the, the delineation of who cannot provide interpretation services. So um, under the Affordable Care Act, it is prohibited to ask minors, friends or family members, or untrained bilingual staff. So anyone who is under the age of 18 um, or uh, someone who brings in their neighbor or their friend or their daughter to come in and, and help them to communicate with their doctor or, and this happens really commonly, uh, 
pulling a nurse who speaks Russian, for example, and they're like, oh, thank God, we have a Russian speaking patient. Uh, the nurse happens to speak Russian. We're going to pull her and have her communicate back and forth between the doctor and the patient. None of these things are permitted under the Affordable Care Act. Um, of course, there are exceptions to these rules in you know, extenuating circumstances, people can sign waivers, um, but the legislation now clearly says this can't happen anymore. Um, and in order to be able to provide interpretive services, you have to be able to uh, show a certain level of skill, which we'll talk about in the coming slides. Next slide, please, Caroline. Okay, Nicole, you wanna take this one? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> of course we're here to talk to you about training and why training is important. Um, the reason that the ACA or Obamacare passed that, that piece of legislation in 1557 was because there was a lot of errors that untrained interpreters commit. You know, The way that people kind of naturally quote unquote interpret is by summarizing, by giving you know, a, a, their own spin on, on, on information. That's kind of the way that we naturally do it. Training is really important because interpreting the correct way is a bit unnatural. You know, you have to take on somebody else's voice and you have to speak exactly how they speak. That's not really a natural thing to do. So these are a couple of things that have been found with untrained interpreters. Um, first is um, adding or substituting words or phrases. So this is really common. You know, untrained interpreters tend to add add a little spin to things. Um, and, you know, sometimes inserting personal opinions, like the, the second bullet, just adding a little bit of information. You know, sometimes it's encouraging um, personal opinion. Sometimes, you know, these things are, are done well-meaning, but they affect the, the patient provider relationship. And that's an important thing. That's the important difference between a trained and an untrained interpreter. Um, untrained interpreters tend to use words or phrases that don't exist. This is, you know, I'm just talking directly to the Spanish speakers, especially because we all know, and we, you know, I love Spanglish, don't get me wrong, but we, we all know how Spanglish can be easily incorporated into um, a conversation. So this is something that I've seen a lot with, with, with Spanish speakers, especially, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico, so I use a lot of Spanglish. Um, but when, when you're talking to a patient that's limited English proficient, if their primary language is Spanish, you know, we should try to communicate as, as much as possible in Spanish. So using words and phrases that doesn't exist, that's something that untrained interpreters do. Um, omitting words or phrases. This is a, a really big and a really important one. And this is actually the most common error of interpretation. Um, and it can be done usually for one of two reasons. The first is because the interpreter simply forgot, you know, they don't have, they haven't built those memorization skills or those note taking skills to be able to interpret for a full conversation without om omitting information. That's something that requires a lot of training and a lot of practice. This. And sometimes it's because they, they just don't know how to interpret it, so they kind of just skip skip through it um, all together and just hope that the patient doesn't doesn't ask any questions. But these are all things um, that untrained interpreters do. Um, you know, we we definitely want all interpreters that that are working in a medical capacity, especially, um, to avoid doing these things. And that's that's where training really comes into place and in practice. Yeah, and I think if all of us are being honest with ourselves, Nicole and I will go first. Um, you know, when we helped people out before we were trained, we we did all of these things, um, and I think that's a really natural impulse or a really natural um, reaction to going into a scenario and being like, "Great, I'm happy to help," and then realizing that you're kind of out of your depth. Um, so it it's we don't want to villainize these mistakes, uh, but the training is meant to curb those impulses and to help you you know, develop your professionalism and understand your ethics and then your skill set, developing your skill set so that you can provide these services well. Next slide. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing to that. Um, thank you for saying that, Stephanie. That's really important. Um, we're definitely not trying to villainize anyone. I was the worst interpreter ever until I got trained. Um, I, I promise I was pretty bad. And I thought, you know, I was, I was just doing the best I could and I didn't realize the way you're supposed to actually interpret as as an interpreter you know I, I like a lot of people was kind of thrown in as interpreting I got hired for a bilingual position started interpreting um and I and I committed a lot of errors and I remember the first time that I saw somebody actually interpret interpret in first person interpret completely I thought it was the weirdest thing I thought it was just odd I thought I thought it seemed very unnatural um, and that's kind of why we do these types of presentations because I realized throughout my own training 
what a big difference um, being trained does and how it affects the patient provider relationship. Um, so definitely not trying to villainize anyone. I'm probably worse than anyone on this call. I was probably worse than anyone on this call, but training really, really helped me out. So getting trained can help to improve the quality of care. So when trained interpreters are involved in conversational interactions, we see higher rates of patient satisfaction, of course, um, fewer errors in communication because we're not doing those things like omitting or changing or um, uh, substituting anything. Um, we also see a reduction in the disparities that we discussed earlier. So, um, you know, more compliance with discharge instructions and understanding of medication and um, different things like that. Uh, and then just basic stuff like not up triaging because you can ask, how are you feeling today or what brought you in today? And the patient can answer. Um, we see improved clinical outcomes. So patients who go home and comply with their discharge instructions tend to do better than patients who don't understand their discharge instructions. Um, and we also see, surprisingly, that the financial cost to the organization goes down. Um, so if you think about up triaging, if that doesn't happen, then that saves money for the organization. Patients aren't readmitted as frequently. Um, there's a lot of different things that can contribute to this actually ending up costing less for the organization, which is counterintuitive. A lot of people assume that it's just an added cost. Let's go on to the next slide. I'm cognizant of time. I know we only have a couple of minutes. Oh, no. Wow, we're going, we're just um, spending a lot of time. Um, all right, so let's talk really quickly about the difference between qualified and certified, okay? Because these are two terms that are often used interchangeably and, and they're kind of obscured on a lot of people know the difference between these terms, so we want to define them for you. Um, so, of course, you understand the differences. So a qualified interpreter, when we use that term qualified interpreter, this is a legal definition. So this is the, the definition that Stephanie was talking to you about earlier, about the ACA. Um, and being qualified as an interpreter meet, means that you're meeting all those requirements from the, um, the, a, the ACA. So again, federal law mandates that interpreters working in federally funded programs are qualified. So what that means is that they have, they've been tested on their language proficiency, they've been tested on their interpretation skills, they've been tested on knowledge of medical and terminology, and an, of interpretation ethics. One thing that's important for you to know is that any interpreter that goes through our ALTA training um, would be a qualified interpreter because we're testing them on all of these, um, these benchmarks that the ACA put in place. Okay, so certified medical interpreter. People, this is a term that's most often used, you know, being certified or not being certified. Um, and what certified means, this is a professional definition. This, this is an interpreter who has completed a 40 hour course. So they've done some, some version of a 40 hour course, ALTAs or, or another 40 hour course. And they've also passed the, the exams required by the two national certifying bodies. So there's two, organizations. There's only two organizations in the entire country that can certify you as a medical interpreter, and that would be a national certification. One's the CCHI, and the other one's the NBCMI. So once you've completed a 40-hour course, you've applied for the certification, you've taken your test for the certification, then you're a certified um, medical interpreter, and that can be done through two organizations again. Right. So what we see is that a lot of people take a 40 hour training and they say, I'm a certified interpreter. And that that's um, inaccurate. We just want to make sure that that we're defining our terms um, correctly here. So um, you can find work generally. It depends on the employer, but most employers uh, will be looking at least for a 40 hour training. Some will be looking for a 40 hour training plus this national level certification. Um, another thing to note here is that 40 hours is the minimum. Um, there are other programs that have longer uh, hour, 60 or 80 hour programs as well. Um, but the 40 hour is currently the prerequisite to be able to apply for these national certification exams. We'll talk about that process a bit more here in a little bit. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so um, here are some questions that we would encourage you to ask if you're considering getting trained when you call these interpreter training programs to see if they're a good fit for you. Um, so one of the things you want to know is what are the com key components of this program? So what am I going to be learning? Um, how does this program evaluate interpreters? So what do your final exams look like? Um, you know, is there anything that, that I need to know about my exams going into this course? Um, does the training style match my learning style? Um, so is it 
something that I can do all on my own time that's pre-recorded? Is it something where I have access to live instructors? Um, is it something where I'm just kind of reading a lot of material? What does the training style look like? Is it in person? In the days of COVID, most things are not, but is it in person? Mm -hmm. Another uh, training uh, style that, that can be uh, used to deliver this curriculum. Um, does it work with my schedule? Who developed this program is big. So did interpreters make this program? Do people with experience um, have uh, like a have their hand in the creation of this curriculum? Um, and if the program is online, what is the format of that training and can I contact the instructor? We are going to show you all just training course here in a minute, which should answer most of these questions. Um, Yes, in fact, I will not answer any of these questions yet because I will. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and skip to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, so these are some photos of some of the teachers of our course. So Nicole and I are up at the top. Um, at the bottom, we have Gerardo and Kate. And actually, I couldn't get a picture of Charles. Charles is another one of our teachers. Um, but all of us are um, minimally at least qualified interpreters. Um, and all of us have, uh, many years of experience as interpreters under our belt. Um, many of us are nationally certified through both organizations, so we have a, a good knowledge of what those tests are like. Um, and so that is a little bit of um, the background of the teachers of this course. All of us are experienced interpreters. Most of us are uh, nationally certified. Can we, Caroline, can we skip ahead? I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, the ALTA training course is called Breaking Boundaries in Healthcare. Yeah, so it's perfect for you if, um, one, you speak two languages. Obviously, if you're going to be an interpreter, that's kind of a minimum qualification. And if you, if you speak them, of course, with a, a pretty high level of proficiency. Um, if you want to work as a professional interpreter, of course, you have to want this. You, this is, uh, has to be a career path that you want. But if this is something that you want, this is the, the right course for you. And, and you also have to be comfortable navigating the internet and using a computer. So this is a web-based course. Um, so we want we want to have um, students that are comfortable using uh, a web-based course, using the internet browser, you know, refreshing back for, you don't have to be like Steve Jobs or anything like that. You just have to have basic knowledge of a, of a computer and um, use of the internet. Everyone here made it to this presentation um, that is web-based. So I think everyone here qualifies for that. Another thing that we should note here, too, is that speaking your two languages fluently is your baseline. So this is your foundation for succeeding in this class. It doesn't guarantee success in this class because, or maybe I should rephrase. So sometimes we get people who call us frequently. We get people who call us and they say, well, I already speak Spanish and English, or I already speak Mandarin and English, so I don't really know, like, can I just take this test? I don't really think I need to go through any sort of training. Um, and this is a really common misconception. I definitely understand uh, the misconception, but it's it it shows a lack of understanding about what interpreter training is, which is again understandable. So we are taking this foundation of at least two languages that you speak, and we're building a new skill set on top of it. So we're going to be talking about best practices and ethics and note taking and uh, memory development and listening skills and cultural competency, all of these sorts of things that we're going to be taking um, and building on this foundation, right? So speaking two languages is not the same as uh, interpretation skill. This is the starting point. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so um, Breaking Boundaries in Healthcare is the 40-hour training that was uh, created by ALTA, uh, developed by a team of nationally certified medical interpreters. It is available to speakers of 42 languages. We're going to talk about the resources that are available uh, by language here in a little bit. Um, and when you register for the course, you get 16 weeks of access to the materials. Um, and the materials include um, pre-recorded lectures and animated slides, so videos of Nicole and me and Kate and Hirano mm -hmm. and Charles talking you about certain things, um, as well as animated slides, um, and we'll show you that here in a minute. Those are things that you can do on your own time. We also have 
um, live video sessions three times a week. These are open to any student who's in the course. Um, so if you feel lost, you can join and ask questions. Um, if you just want to meet other students, talk to your teacher, get more depth out of the class, that's what those are designed for. Um, so those are three times a week on Zoom. Um, and then for our top four languages, Spanish, Arabic, Mandarin, and Vietnamese, um, we do have uh, live group interpretation practice with a professional interpreter in that language. I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. Um, you also get access to your digital course books, bilingual medical glossaries if they're available in your language. Um, and we also have a study timeline and a study guide. Um, I'll show you that in a minute, some practice videos in language. You can also sign up for optional private interpretation coaching. So if you're like, you know what, I just want to work with a professional interpreter in my language and get feedback from me by myself, that's something that you can add on. It is an extra cost because it's a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session, but it is available in many languages. Um, and the cost of the course also includes your final written exams through Alta. So this does not include your written and oral exams through the national certifying bodies if that's what you choose to do, but it does include Alta's final written and oral exam, uh, one of each. Can I just want to uh, add? Then, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can go ahead and finish, and I'll add at the end. Uh, so once we pass our, our final written and oral exams through Alta, then you earn your certificate of qualification, um, and we will send that to you, and you can use it to apply for work, to apply for national certification. You can use it for this sort of things. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to add that this is really the importance of shopping around for a course. Um, you know, our, our course includes all of these um, resources, it includes our course book, it includes, um, of course, the actual, um, the slides, it includes um, the glossary, the coaching, that's huge, the sessions with a live instructor for you to act, talk to, and, you know, all for $650. Um, I've, I've worked with interpreters in the past that have paid for courses that are much more expensive and they don't have all these robust resources. Um, so I'm not trying to, you know, say, I mean, our course really does have the, the most robust resources of any other course, but I'm not saying don't look around. But what I'm saying is really shop around and look for a course and make sure that it has the resources that make sense for you and the ones that would work best for, for you. Because I would hate for one of you to overpay for a course and you don't really feel like you're getting what you need out of it. All right, Caroline, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so talking a lot of people have a lot of questions about our tests. Um, I'm going to show you actually something similar to what our written exam look like, looks like. Um, it's all in English, um, and it evaluates your theoretical understanding of interpretation. So do you understand standards of practice and code of ethics? Do you understand your basic medical information? Nothing huge and scary, but basic medical information. Um, do you understand cultural competency? These sorts of things. Um, and then our oral assessment is done over the phone, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes, and you'll be on the phone with two real people, <laughs> um, and you'll be interpreting back and forth between them. So uh, someone playing the part of an English-speaking doctor, someone playing the part of a, a patient speaking your target language. All right, Caroline, we're ready for the next one. Okay, so we are ready for a virtual tour. Um, I can go ahead and share my screen if I get. Yeah, hold on a second, Stephanie. Let me make you the presenter now. Thank you. So cool to see all the, the updates, you guys. Um, We're really excited to show you. Yeah. Let's see. Presenter, then you should be able to share your screen. Just let me know. All righty. Here we go. Okay. Hmm. Let me stop. Okie doke. Now we are ready. Thank you for your patience. Oh, okay. It keeps popping up with my our faces. Um, I let me see here. Yeah, I see your faces, but I also see the, I also see the. I saw the screen. So maybe try just try click, clicking it again. Share. Okay. Okay. I think we've done yeah. it. Awesome. Okay. Here we go. Awesome. 
Great. So um, this is the home page of our uh, current online medical interpreter training. And I'm going to walk you through how you would navigate it if you were uh, in the course. So um, the first thing that I want to show you is what it looks like to view one of our modules. So this is an example of uh, our cardiovascular system module. So um, Actually, I'm going to mute it so you can't hear it talking over me. Um, but this is a slide that has um, audio over it, and we're talking about anemia in relation to um, the hematic system or you know, the blood in the cardiovascular system. Um, the medical chapters uh, go through um, how a, a body system works, different illnesses or diseases that are related to that body system, um, as well as symptoms and diagnosis complications, treatment, that sort of thing. Our goal with this is not to make you interpret or not to make you doctors, it is to make you interpreters. Um, we don't want you guys to um, leave, you know, being able to diagnose anemia, for example. But what we do want is for you to know what you're talking about if you're interpreting for a patient who has anemia. Um, if you understand what you're saying or if you've heard it before, it's easier for you to retain it um, in comparison to if you're hearing something for the very first time. That's very difficult to retain and then convert to a new language and then you know, speak. Um, so that is uh, what we cover in our medical chapters. Um, we have these little pr quick practice um, interpretation slides. Actually, Caroline, let me know if you can hear this. This could mean that you're fighting an infection. Can you come back next week? Yes. Yes. Great. So this is an example of like just a quick practice where we have you interpreting along with basic sentences like this. Um, and then we also have these little practice videos. These are in English. Um, so these are um, something that we have at the end of almost every medical chapter. So this is a medical chapter. Um, I also want to show you an example of a theory chapter. So this is the chapter on the modes of interpretation. Um, and uh, this is more like lecture heavy. So these have more videos of, I'm going to mute this, um, teachers talking to you. Uh, but we also have uh, animated slides that look something like this. So these are, there's an audio that's running over this too. I just don't want to have conflicting noise. Um, but there are animated slides. Um, and then we also have uh, videos of, um, teachers talking to you. So here's a, a mode switching practice scenario. And then Kate giving us a follow up. Okay. Did you try the exercise? I didn't go. Did you notice a change in the speed? Did you maybe get tripped up at some point and have to start simultaneously interpreting? Okay. So this is an example of what a theory uh, chapter looks like. Um, it's just kind of a mixture of animated slides and videos like this of us talking to you, um, bits, and pra bits of practice here and there. Um, okay, so another thing that I want to show you is some of the resources that are available to you in digital copy when you are part of the course. So the first thing that I can show you is our course book. Let me get that pulled up. So this is our digital student textbook. Um, again, this is available to you in digital copy for free in the class. Um, and it just accompanies the, the chapters um, that you're going through in the course. So the first chapter is on language access and disparities in healthcare. Um, and this is, again, something that you can open up from the course. Another thing that we have is a role play workbook. Um, so this is a resource that's available to you to use for practice. Um, so, and it's broken down by medical chapters. So if you want to practice um, a triaging scenario in the emergency room that's related to the musculoskeletal system, then you can come here and you can practice interpreting along with this role play workbook. One thing that I'm really excited about that we've recently added to this role play workbook is a section on practicing impartiality. Um, so we have a whole series of um, uh, role plays that are related to um, interpretations that are meant to make you uncomfortable and, and kind of challenge you so that you can practice your impartiality. Another thing that we hear from students pretty frequently is I cannot be trusted to um, plan my time within these 16 weeks. I need more structure. 
just tell me what I need to do every week so that I can be done in this timeline. Uh, so we did that. We created a 16 week study guide that's broken down by week. Um, and it tells you the different chapters that we want you to go through and practice with so that you're using your time properly through the course. Okay. Um, all right, so the last thing that I wanna show you in terms of English specific stuff, nope, there's two more things, um, are office hours. Uh, so office hours is, uh, these. there are these live Zoom sessions that we have, we hold them three times a week and students can join, here's Kate, this is me, we're talking about um, lots of different things. People come with their questions and we answer them and we have them labeled. So if you want to um, go in and watch any of the recordings, you can search, for example, if I wanted to search note taking, um, I could watch this uh, recorded uh, office hours practice where we, uh, we did some exercises with note taking. Um, okay, so that is office hours. The last English specific thing that I wanna show you is a quiz. These quizzes are just meant to be learning checks for students. So they're not, I don't mind sharing them with you, they're not secret. Um, but this is what one looks like. Um, it's kind of a mixture of true, true false, um, fill in the blank, multiple choice and matching kinds of questions. And this is actually the same format that you'll see for your final written exam through us. Um, so if you feel comfortable, it's very simple. If you want to um, select an answer, then you just click. And then at the end, there's a submit button and you can submit your quiz. Um, and so your, your final written exam will look something similar to this. The only difference is that it's longer and it's graded and it's timed. So this is all of the English specific stuff that we have in the class. So a lot of times we get students who say, well, I expected my medical lessons to be taught in, um, in Spanish, or I expected them to be taught in Vietnamese, for example. All of this curriculum is in English. Um, and we're prompting you to do work, practicing, interpreting into your target language. Um, but we also have language specific materials. If you want to look um, at what the language specific materials are, you can come to our Alta um, website. And if you go to services and then online medical interpreter training, and then you scroll down, we do have a list of what languages include which resources. So if you are an Arabic speaker, for example, these are the things that would be available to you as part of the course. Um, optional one-on-one -on -one coaching is $60 an hour additional, um, but we do have these live group coaching sessions that are included for Arabic speakers. So I do wanna show you what that looks like. I feel like I've been talking for a long time. I wanna pause for questions. It's like the teacher in me. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, our Arabic learning resources page. So once a week we have a group session with a professional Arabic interpreter. He's wonderful. He works with Arabic speakers um, of all different dialects. He's really, really good with answering questions about dialect and vocabulary and phrasing and all of that kind of stuff. He's really wonderful. Um, and we have a couple of recordings of the sessions with him in case this time doesn't work for you. We also have a medical terminology glossary that's available in Arabic. And again, it's broken down by uh, by medical chapters. So this is on the cardiovascular system. This is on the digestive system, for example. Um, going back to Arabic learning resources. And then we also have an interpretation practice video for um, uh, a scenario regarding asthma with an Arabic speaking patient and as a, an English speaking doctor. Um, and we have a couple of those available to you, as well as a rubric that you can use to evaluate your interpretation um, if you've recorded it. So um, for our four biggest languages, this is what the resources look like. For Spanish learning resources, it's similar. We have these uh, weekly sessions. We have um, a glossary available to you that's broken down, um, again, by uh, medical chapter. Um, and those practice videos, uh, and the rubrics that go with them as well. The biggest thing that I would want you to, to know to take advantage of are these group interpretation coaching sessions that we have available. Those are really wonderful and provide a lot of depth for the class. Okay, so things that I've covered. <laughs> uh, medical chapters, the theory chapters, 
the office hours, which are um, live and recorded so you can watch them anytime, your digital textbook, role play workbook, and your bilingual resources. Um, again, if you want to go check what your language includes in terms of resources, that is transparent on our website. Um, the other thing that is really great about um, these learning resources is that you can get in touch with other students who speak your language in the class. Um, so you can, you can post in this forum and form study groups or um, you know, ask questions that you have. Of course, you can always come to us with questions that you have, but this is just another really nice way to be able to connect. We see that students who uh, form study groups with others tend to do really well. Okay, I think I've covered everything. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Nicole, can you Stephanie. think of anything that I should include here that I haven't? Yes. I was just gonna ask if, if you have, I see that you have more slides. Do you want me to? Yes, please, thank you. Okay, one second. And it looks like Nicole, Dropped oh. off, I don't, maybe connection yeah. issue. Um. Okay. Okay. So um, let's say that you have taken a 40 hour training or um, your initial interpreter training through Alta or through any other organization, um, and you're wondering what's next. So this could be um, where you start applying for work. Um, you can look at different employers and see what they require. If they require uh, for you to be qualified, then that is what we do. Uh, and you can use your ALTA certificate and the test scores that you get through ALTA to apply for those jobs. Um, we, let's go to the next slide because I think we're gonna... Mm -hmm. So national certification is something that you can do after your 40 hour training. We've touched on this briefly. Nicole mentioned the two organizations, the NBCMI, which stands for the National Board of Certification for Medical Interpreters, and the CCHI, which is the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters. Now, there are, uh, for some languages, two steps, and for some language, one step. Three steps and two steps. Depends on how you look at the steps. So you would apply for national uh, certification. You would apply to sign up for these exams. Um, and they will review your application. We're gonna talk about the prerequisites here in a moment. Um, and if you apply and, um, and you are able to take your exams, um, then your first step would be a written exam, um, which is kind of similar to what we do. It's, it's, uh, it's an English only test that's on theory. Um, and then once you pass your written exam, if there is an oral exam in your language on the national level, then you would move on and take that oral exam. So there are six languages available through the NBCMI, three languages available through the CCHI. If your language is not listed here, then there is the option through both organizations to just take the written exam. Um, and if you earn, if you pass the written exam and earn that credential, then your credential through the CCHI would be core CHI, you would be core CHI certified. And I believe the NBCMI is the hub CMI. Um, so if you speak Haitian Creole or if you speak Burmese, for example, that would be a good option for you if you wanted to get a national certification. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so requirements to apply for national certification. You have to be 18 years or older. You have to have some sort of high school diploma or an equivalent. You need to submit proof of your 40-hour medical interpreter training your language proficiency in English, and your language proficiency in your other language. The awesome thing about ALTA is that ALTA satisfies all three of these prerequisite requirements. So when you take our oral exams at ALTA, it's not possible to pass those exams unless you speak both of your languages. So when you go to apply to uh to take the cchi exams they're going to ask you for proof of these three things and you can submit your alta certificate for all three so alta certificate for 40 hour training for english proficiency and then for your other language proficiency um, this is really great because it kills three birds with one stone um, you don't have to go out and find some sort of 
um, documentation that proves your proficiency in your other languages if you have your ALTA certificate. It'll check all of those boxes for you. And go ahead and skip to the next slide. So um, again, the steps are that you will apply. Once you are approved, then you'll take your written assessment. And once you take and pass your written assessment, then you will take your oral assessment if it's available in your language, and then you will hold national certification. And go to the next slide. Now, um, if the whole time we've been in this presentation and you're like, oh, get to other stuff because you've already taken your 40 hour training. Um, we do have something that could help if you want to take your national certification exams, but you want to prep. So our national certification prep course um, is really designed for people who maybe took their 40 hour training several years ago. They just want a refresher um, and you just want some structured practice going into your exams. You want to further your career as a professional interpreter. Um, so we do have that course available. You can check that out on our website. Go to the next slide, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, now, let's imagine that you already have your national certification. So you've done these two steps. You've taken your 40 or more hour training. You've gotten your national certification, but you need to uphold your national certification. Um, in order to keep your national certification, actually, this is on the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. The CCHI requires 32 hours of CEUs every four years. Um, and four of those hours have to come from performance-based training. We'll talk about that in a minute. The NBCMI requires three hours of training every, sorry, three CEUs, 30 hours of training every five years um, for you to be able to uphold that credential. This is perfect. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so we do have all to CEUs that comply with that. Um, Nicole, do you want to hop in and talk about interpretation oh, coaching? Sorry about that. I thought I was muted while I was clearing my throat. Um, yeah, so for interpretation coaching, sorry guys, had a little disconnection there, but interpret, um, interpretation coaching is perfect for anyone um, that wants to boost their skills with guided practice. So what you're doing is you're just really working on whatever you need to work on, whatever your interpretate, whatever you feel like um, is something that's challenging for you as you're interpreting. You can just talk to your coach and work with somebody that's qualified, that has a lot of experience, that has a lot of experience also training and they can work one-on-one -on -one, um with really whatever you need it's something that's completely um guided by you um the cool thing about our ceus is that it serves kind of two purposes for one you can you know you can boost your own interpretation skills but it also satisfies the performance-based ceu requirement from the cchi so that's really awesome so if you're um uh, an interpreter that currently has um, their certification with the CCHI and you're trying to figure out how you're going to fulfill this requirement, having interpretation coaching is one of the, the ways that you can fulfill that. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So those are the interpretation coaching is, is good for the performance based requirements or actually, I, yeah, the performance based requirements. We also have um, pre recorded online on demand. Um, CEUs as well. Uh, we have two that are just in English. Uh, they are on uh, psychiatric interviews. We actually did that CEU with a professional psychiatrist who talked about the ways that she analyzes um, language to arrive at a mental health diagnosis and how important interpreters are in that process. Um, and then the other one is called Scripts for Sticky Situations. We wrote that because we feel like in interpreter training, we talk a lot about um, remaining transparent or intervening or clarifying, um, but it can be really difficult to think of an actual script, like what you will actually say if you need to um, tell somebody that, that you'd like to interpret for them instead of their daughter, for example. Like what are the ways that you can do that so that you're uh, preserving the uh, good vibes of that interaction. Um, <laughs> how can you do that in a way that um, that feels diplomatic? Um, so that's what that one is about. We also have two CEUs that are specifically for Spanish interpreters. Uh, one is on ambiguity. So if I say, look at that dog with one eye, does that mean that you need to close your eye or does that mean the dog has one eye? And if you're interpreting an encounter that's, or a sentence that's ambiguous, how do you preserve that ambiguity? What do you do? Um, and then the other one is on profanity. Uh, we know that some people have varying levels of comfort with profanity, but it does come up 
Um, so we want to prep you for those eventualities. So that's what that one's on. Caroline, I want to be cognizant of time. We have just a couple more slides. Um, is it okay if we keep going? Yeah, of course. No worries. All right. We'll we'll go through them quickly ish. <laughs> okay. This is good. So we do have a discount code for you. If you're watching this presentation, it will take $25 off of your payment um, for the class. It's Boost 25, all lowercase. Um, Caroline, if we can go to the next slide so I can talk about the structures of payment options. So you can either pay in full for 650, 625 if you apply this discount code. We also have a payment plan. You would start for $200 and then for the three months after that, you would pay $150 a month. If we do quick math, that is uh, $650 total. <laughs> it doesn't end up costing you anything extra. Um, it's just a way to kind of spread it out over essentially four months. Um, so if you were to use the discount code on the payment plan, it would just bring that $200 deposit down to $175. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Oh, if you want to contact us, this is our phone number and our email address. You can also check out our website. It's just learn.altalang.com or you can Google Alta Interpreter Training and it should pop up pretty easy. Do we have um, time or uh, does anybody have any? We're happy to stay if you guys have questions. Um, let me let me just check the question panel. I know that there were some questions on um, on the pricings, which you guys just went over. So uh, let's see, question about Persian Farsi. Do you have that in the target language available? If you wanna be very transparent about, about Persian, that is one language where you can take the English resources. We don't have um, extra resources in, in Persian. Okay, good to know. We do have like a, um, we do sometimes recommend like certain outside resources in terms of glossaries and different things like that if we don't have them ourselves. It's not something we do a lot, but we do it if, if you know, we notice student need for it. So we can recommend somewhere that you can find a glossary at least, um, but that is, we do wanna be very transparent mm -hmm. about what that involves. Gotcha. Um, oh, let's sorry, see. one last thing. I should answer it. Um, so I think just because of time. Oh, sorry. Real quick about for, uh, about Farsi. Um, we do have a final oral exam in Farsi, so you can earn your certificate. You can take the course and you can earn your certificate um, upon passing that oral interpretation exam. So that is one thing that we do have available to to Farsi speakers. Okay, great. Good to know. Um, just checking if there's any last questions. Just because of time, maybe we can. Um, uh, I will make sure to send out the slide, uh, the the contact information along with the recording of the webinar to all participants, um, so that you can reach out to to Stephanie or Nicole or um, their other colleagues to get your your questions answered. If that's all right with you guys. Yeah, sounds good. Absolutely. Thank Great. You well, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Um, it was this was yeah, really informative and. Um, you know, I loved seeing the seeing some of the updates that you guys have, have implemented. So thank you so much for being on with us and um, interpreters listening out there. Uh, stay tuned for the next webinar and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Bye -bye.